kind of press the I think it's so funny when it does that. I know, it's so weird. <laughs> um, all right, hello. My voice is a little tired because I was just at a bridal shower, so nothing like a podcast with a tired voice. <laughs> but you bring the energy, so I'm super excited to have you on again. If Yay. you are listening to this for the first time and you didn't hear, we did one all about starting out breastfeeding kind of the first things in the first six weeks and people loved you they loved you they're like encore encore bring natalie back so i was like all right great let's do it so we are going to go over the top breastfeeding hurdles to overcome in the journey of breastfeeding so to start out do you want to just give a little ditty tell us why you're the go- yeah. why you're my guru <laughs> you know stuff about this and then we'll kind of go over the top hurdles just to give some more support to people if they're having some struggles sounds fabulous so i'm natalie um i have been breastfeeding one or two children for the last nine and a half years um my daughter is nine and a half i have a son who's just over seven i have a three-year-old who i'm still nursing and i'm growing our fourth baby i'm 37 weeks now and we'll be having this baby soon so we'll be tandem nursing these to. Um, but besides just the personal part of managing a lot of breastfeeding myself, I have been super passionate about breastfeeding since I was in about high school. <laughs> now, my mom was a nurse. She worked uh, in mother baby world. She actually was integral and in part of getting baby friendly status for some of the hospitals in the area that I live in in California. And in high school, she would drag me along to these <laughs> conferences <laughs> right. and like hear these amazing speakers. And I felt like this is super interesting. And so I went to college, I played college volleyball, but I got a job at WIC and I started working for a women in infant health at the state level in their breastfeeding promotion department. So I got to learn more there and um, attend more conferences and like, you know, had posters of breastfeeding women in my dorm room wall. <laughs> like I was one of those crazy <laughs> long before I was even a mom. Um, and I ended up getting my degree in child development super passionate about children and how they develop. But what I learned there was really that like 90% of kids' brains developed before the age of three, as far as like, like the deep things like attachment and trust and all of that. And that really having a secure attachment initially was what was like most important for children. And so I ended up deciding to go back to school after graduating with my first degree and becoming a nurse. When my mom was a nurse, my grandma was a nurse, my sister's now a nurse, my husband's a nurse, nurses. Oh my God. I went back to nursing. I thought, you know what? If I could become a nurse and I could work in labor and delivery and I could help moms with breastfeeding, I could help that initial attachment. And we'd have more functioning like kindergartners, which is what I thought I wanted to do in the first place with my child development. So I went back and became a nurse. So I was a labor and delivery nurse for a handful of years. Through that time, had my first two kiddos and then decided I didn't like being gone 12 to 12 and a half hours at a time from my kids. And I transitioned into education. So I started teaching childbirth classes, breastfeeding classes. I became an IBCLC, which means I'm an international board certified lactation consultant. Whoa. I have the, the privilege of helping women with breastfeeding anywhere I decide to go in the, uh, the world. And um, then I started running support groups. So I've been running breastfeeding support groups since I was pregnant, so seven years, um, oh since gosh. I was pregnant with my seven-year-old and um, have just walked women through a lot of challenges and have had a lot of experience just um, in community mostly. I find that like some of the best breastfeeding support happens in community. I don't believe we were ever meant to do this motherhood journey alone. So facilitating, com- facilitating community has been probably my biggest passion over the last few years. Um, so yeah, that's me. So then how can we find you? I always like to start with that too. Oh yeah. So I'm on social media world. I'm in Facebook and in Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is standing so tall. I'm, you can't tell on this, but I'm six one. <laughs> so I'm tall. I'm like, well, there you go. <laughs> We're just going to call myself standing so tall. Um, I call children. Everyone's tall. Um, so I'm there. And then in that uh, personal Instagram, there is a link to my community carriage house, which is my small breastfeeding support group Instagram. I will tell you, it's not been very active lately over this past COVID year. We've not been meeting in person. We've been meeting on Zoom and I have been doing construction on the back part of my uh, house. (laughs) 
so that I have a physical space to run my support groups. And ideally the goal, the dream of the community care child is that we will not only offer breastfeeding support, but education, childbirth classes, newborn classes, all of those things I have stopped doing. I stopped working at the hospital about two years ago. I have moved into more independent practice and really focusing on raising my kids and homeschooling them. So I've been more in mom world and a little less in lactation, especially with this last year of the pandemic and crazy. Right. So, right. Um, but that will hopefully get going again um, per the climate of the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you do Zoom calls, right? Yes. So every Tuesday uh, in the afternoon, I'm in California. So Pacific Standard Time, 3 30. Um, I do a Zoom call. It's a free, just group, Zoom breastfeeding support group. So anyone can come 3.30 to 4.30, tune in, ask questions, just hear other moms. Pregnant moms are welcome. I love, 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 love it when pregnant women will come to support groups before they've had their babies. Um, two reasons. One, just sitting and listening to women who are in it is very different than a reading it. book or going to a class. So currently we've got two moms in our group. One of them just delivered her baby less than two weeks ago. And the other one has a one month old. So if you're pregnant and you're able to sit and listen to this mommy of uh, like one week old say, totally. hey, this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm struggling through. It just is so much more real than reading it in a book. Yeah. Like the book will tell you your baby will cluster feed and then you'll move on to the next sentence. <laughs> this mom will tell you what it's really like. like oh my baby's been on my boob 24 seven and I right. can't, uh, whatever. Yeah. So that's always great. And then I, I always believe that we, especially if you're pregnant with your first baby, we like to call you a, uninitiated, <laughs> we're an uninitiated mommy, I love it. <laughs> but you don't realize how interesting, um, hormonal, challenging early postpartum is. It's really a very different time in life. We don't talk about it culturally very much. We don't support it very well culturally. So if you are in postpartum and you have a brand new baby and you're vagina's hurting because you just delivered a baby and you haven't slept, you don't even know what day it is. You haven't <laughs> eaten very much. It's really, really hard to remember that Zoom call and try something brand new. Like yeah. most postpartum women won't try something brand new no. in the first month postpartum. No. It's way too intimidating. There's too much more. to do. There's, There's your brain is in 15 different places and also kind of shut off. Like, Yes, it's yeah. overwhelming. And so if you have come either in person or on Zoom to a support group, at least a few times, you oh, know God. the faces that will be there. You know the oh, expectation. I mean, like we have moms that come in their pajamas because we don't expect you to get dressed if yeah. you have a new baby, like just come. Yeah. And so if you can come pregnant and you can see that, then you are like exponentially more likely to come postpartum. Absolutely. So I highly encourage the pregnant women, especially to tune in and just listen to the conversation yeah. and questions and get a gauge for like what women are experiencing. And watching other women troubleshoot. So if you see someone else experience something, you're like, what? Your nipples can bleed? What? And then they're like, yeah, but that it's no big deal. These are a few things that you can try. So then when it happens to you, you're like, oh, I think this is, well, I don't know if this is normal, but I know that there are things that can happen or like ways. Yeah. To yeah. Well, and the power of having, let's say eight women, even on a screen, and having a new mom who says, oh, my nipples are so sore. And then me saying, okay, can everyone who had sore nipples raise their hand and eat <laughs> what's <feel> like this? <laughs> right. That's powerful because then when you're sitting there with your sore nipples, you're like, here I am. Like, I must be part of the, this is it. This is what we do. Right. Sore nipples happen right. and I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And so I think there, there's so much power in that. Um, yeah. And like, what did everybody do to get yes. through it or what do I have to do? Yes. Or, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I agree. So, so then let's just go right there. So cracked okay. nipples can be something that happens. And I yes. actually had a few people be like, is there anything that I can do be while I'm pregnant to prevent this? And I'm like, there is, are you saying <laughs> well, yes? So here, here, let me tell you my, my two cents on this. This, <laughs> is, like, wait, what? this is, this is more personal opinion than it is data. Okay. I don't, I can't back this with data, but I think there's a few factors here. 
one back in the day did you ever hear like our mom's generation they would say like roughen up your nipples with a uh, like washcloth to like prepare no. them for breastfeeding have you ever heard that no okay. so it's like one of these like wives tales the old old-fashioned things like oh well don't forget to like roughen up your nipples with a washcloth now some people think like, that is just ridiculous and stupid but what i think <laughs> like a wet or dry um i don't know i think i have no idea That's okay a good question. i was assume <laughs> what in the shower i don't know Oh, but what I, what I think happens is that what I believe could happen, I should say this, what I believe could happen is that if you are allowing your nipples to feel uncomfortable and you're doing it with the intention mm. of prepping, mm. that puts you in a really different mindset than never touching your nipples. And then having a baby who's like a Hoover vacuum, who is relying on your nipples <laughs> yeah. to survive. So I wonder, and I'm just going to say it's not data. I just wonder if when women did something purposeful, I'm like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Ooh, but you know what? I'm prepping and my nipples are going to feel good. You know, it'll be fine. It'll be better. That when the time came, totally. it was uncomfortable. Right. At least we're like, well, I prepped for this. Yeah. I more of a mindset than actually tough enough. The mindset. Mm. Yes. And whether it actually works to toughen your nipples or not, I have no idea. Right. But mm. the mindset of I did something to prepare, I'm used to feeling discomfort here, doesn't mean that I'm doing something wrong. And then then the feeling of like, well, I wonder how bad it would have been had I not prepared. Good thing I prepared. Uh-huh. That I think is super powerful. Interesting. And so I, not that I'm saying everyone go rough enough your nipples, but like, <laughs> I just wonder, I wonder about the power of that mm-hmm. experience. The other thing that I think makes a difference is that women who have chosen an unmedicated birth tend to power through nipple pain in a different way. Hmm. Like if I have mentally prepared for an unmedicated birth, and I will say that I have had three home births, I'm planning my fourth. So I have had unmedicated births. Wow. That's mental prep. That's physical prep. Like you don't go into wanting an unmedicated experience without preparing. Right. And some of those skills that you use to prepare you use when you're breastfeeding, you use when your nipples hurt, you use in the initial postpartum when you're cramping. And so I, I think that that's Hmm. a factor too. If women go into birth thinking like I'm getting all the drugs and I'm not going to feel a single thing, then nipple pain is shocking. (laughs) It's like, Like this is crazy and uncomfortable. Like what on earth is going on? There must be something wrong because I haven't experienced discomfort to this point. So not like once again not that this is i just wonder about these things because i feel like i see commonalities between women who have prepped in some way or have chosen to prepare for a natural birth that seem to manage the discomfort of nipples um being sore and things like that just differently i remember my labor and delivery well one of the nurses, I don't know, afterwards, I was like doing some nursing. We were like kind of figuring it out. She was latching and I was like, yeah, yeah. Later they were like, that's a wrong latch, but she was latching and I was proud. But um, she like looked me in my soul and was like, if you want to breastfeed, you need to like at least give it two full weeks. And I was like, oh, okay. But like after those two weeks, the nipple pain kind of dulls off a little bit. So I was like, oh, thank you, nurse. That looked into my soul. Like you just (laughs) told me like stick through it for, and it can go, I mean, I don't know how, how, is that typical two weeks? So it's typical. So I like to think of it like a new pair of high heeled shoes. Like the first (laughs) day you buy a new pair of high heeled shoes, if you go (laughs) dancing all night, you're going to hurt. Like you're going to have blisters in your feet. Your feet are going to hurt. That not that the shoes are wrong sized or that they're not going to be your favorite pair of high heeled shoes someday, but like the actual reality is the tissue of your feet have to adjust to the new shoe. Yeah, <laughs> like right. that has to happen. Yeah. And if you only wear them once every six months, you're never going to get used to them. But like if you wear them every day and you put a band aid where you get a blister right. and you massage your feet afterwards or whatever, like you can easily quickly get that shoe broken in and get your feet used to it and have no problem with your high heel. analogy. Shoe. Yeah. So I feel the same way about breastfeeding. Like there are um, women who will like have soreness and then they put a nipple shield on right away, even though they don't need a nipple shield. I'm like that you're just avoiding the working through the soreness. Like the Mm -hmm. soreness is going to 
have to be worked through, but putting a nipple shield on is like putting your tennis back on and being like, just never mind. So is there any, is it just tough it out or is there anything that can- So, so there's, there's two different things happening here. Nipple soreness that uh, to me, there's an umbrella of normal nipple soreness. And then there's the umbrella of like, this is abnormal, cracked, bleeding, lasting longer than two weeks. So let's talk about the normal nipple soreness. I think one of the myths we tell women is if you're doing it right, it doesn't hurt. Yes. Nah. That's like saying, if your shoes are the right size, you won't get a blister. Nah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but maybe not. Also, I've had three babies and I will tell you with my second, my first was two years old. I was still breastfeeding her and my nipples were still sore. What? <laughs> they were still sore because he was new and he had to learn what he was doing. And my hormones had shifted from birth. And even though I was still nursing a two-year-old who had toughened up my nipples. That's and had shocking. Years, yes. So same thing happened. I was still nursing my three-year-old when my other son was born and my nipples were sore and now not sore for as long. And because I know better, I just power through like, oh yeah, it's a little uncomfortable, whatever, because I know it's going to last for only a little while. But even with an experienced mom with experienced breasts, right. the baby's still new. <laughs> the baby's right. still learning. The baby's still trying to figure it out. Yeah. So um, soreness, I believe, is not an indication that everything is going wrong. It is not an indication that you can't breastfeed. It's not an indication that there's even anything wrong at all. It just might be normal new soreness. And we usually tell moms two to three weeks, you're going to have that soreness. And now that does not mean, however, that when the soreness disappears, it never comes back. You might get sore again at a growth spurt at six weeks when the baby's nursing like crazy. You might get sore again. We're going to talk about this later when the baby starts to get teeth or you might, you might, and probably yes, with like 95% certainty have other times of soreness. When you have your first period, your nipples are going to be sore again because your hormones are going to shift. Like hmm. nipple soreness doesn't equal something's wrong with breastfeeding. Uh -huh. Um, all, you know, sometimes we'll talk about that, but normal nipple soreness that lasts for the first couple of weeks may come back depending on, I mean, right now I can tell you my nipples hurt so bad when my three-year-old latches, it really? is toe curling painful for about the first 30 seconds to a minute. And then it's manageable. <laughs> That's hormonal. That's yeah. I, hormones are different because I'm pregnant now that has been like that your whole pregnancy or just recently. Um, I would say it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So at the very, very, very beginning, no. And then probably, well, by about between 14 and 17 weeks, gestation is when you start making colostrum. Mm -hmm. And so your body shifts from like more mature milk to colostrum. So I would say around that shift of Interesting. the placenta really getting going and colostrum being made is when my nipples started to get sore. Mm. Um, and it's just gotten progressively worse. Um, but once again, it's like, it's 30 seconds and right. I have context for like, I care about a breastfeeding relationship and I don't care that it like hurts for a little bit. I can take a deep breath and like power through. So some of it's just, right. Just so when, when do you know <laughs> but, when it's more of a problem? So, yeah. so let me, um, one more thing to tell you about that. So the yeah. normal soreness for a lot of women, I would say we, ex I would expect an, a, the initial latch to be like, Oh, ah, and that uncomfortable, like, oh gosh, 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 lasting for somewhere between 30 seconds and a minute. Okay. After that time, usually once like you've had a, a letdown maybe, or the milk's flowing a little bit more, if you can like take a deep breath, I'll tell moms, if you can literally watch a TV show while you're breastfeeding, your soreness is not enough for me to worry about. If you can fall asleep while your baby is latched, your soreness is not enough for me to worry about. Like if you have latched your baby and that was really, really awful, but then you can relax into like, this isn't so bad. That's normal. And yeah. that's, sorry, yeah. that's going to disappear probably within those two. Okay. Weeks. That's good to know. Yeah. So like, that's what we're looking for is like soreness. It might be awful, but then it's going to dissipate. And like, that would be what in my world, normal. normal. Okay. Now the mommy who says to me, I can't make it through a nursing session without crying because it hurts Ooh. the entire 20 minutes. <sighs> that's not normal. Like that yeah. is not, <laughs> that's not the kind of soreness we're talking about. Yeah. Or the baby that comes off and there's a crack and there's blood, probably something else going on. Um, if the nipple goes in, like it's round, but when it comes out, it looks like a lipstick, like it's yeah. kind of pointed. 
That's an indication that the latch is maybe not deep enough. We have a tongue tie that something else is going on. Yeah. And so if a mom says, oh, I'm so sore and I'm looking at her nipples and they're round when they go in and they're round when they come out and she's able to carry on a conversation with me, you're over here and this is normal and you're going to power through. If I'm talking to a mom who, when her nipple goes in, it's round and when it comes out, it's pointed and she's like, "Ah, ah," the whole time we're feeding and she doesn't even want to latch her baby because of how painful it is or it's a different story. So I think really being able to decipher where you're at, which is why it's wonderful to have a lactation consultant, just sit with you while you're breastfeeding or go to a support group and just sit and nurse in those that first week, because we can easily say like, oh, you're, you're over here. You're going to power through. Everything's going to be fine. Or are you over here? And a lot of times on the other side, when things are not going well, we see it in other ways. Baby's not peeing and pooping or gaining weight. Like there's not enough milk transfer. We talked about supply and demand in our last video. Like there's usually something else that's also happening. So the mother's pain is just one of the many things that indicate there's a, a disruptance in the baby's breastfeeding. Now, if a mom says, let's say she's at three weeks or four weeks and she's still feeling sore, she's not cracked and bleeding and, you know, pointed lipstick and there's no other issues. Baby seems to be fine, but she's still feeling sore. My next question often is, are you giving a pacifier? Because a suck on a pacifier is completely different than the suck on a breast. Hmm. It takes, I think it's like six nerves and 26 muscles to coordinate sucking, swallowing, and breathing. And it's different on a pacifier, a bottle, and a breast. So if a mom is introducing other nipples to that baby, she will make herself more sore for longer because that baby is not able to decipher what suck goes where. Oh, wow. (laughs) I usually tell moms like nothing but you for the first month to six weeks weeks and we would expect your soreness to be gone by then your supply to be fine but if you are going well I nurse and then I give a pacifier and I nurse and I give a pacifier and I've got a one month old and my nipple still hurts yeah because that pacifier suck on your nipple will hurt you yeah yeah so the um yeah okay so if somebody does have the cracked nipples what is is it tough it out or is there like have you ever heard of Uh, those silver things there's so many things for nipple. Okay. And I would say that's a lot of it becomes like um, what's financially in your budget. Okay. <laughs> what, um, like, first thing we want to do is figure out why you're cracked and bleeding and, and solve that problem, right? Okay. Like, we don't want to just put a band aid on it and then like continue to have it. Right. So, consulting with someone who can help you figure out like, why is it that I'm getting cracked? And then to heal, um, one of the best things you can do is putting breast milk on your nipples. So like hand expressing breast milk on and like letting them air dry, be free at home without a shirt on. Yeah. Like let your body, your breast be air out. Hmm. Um, there are great hydrogels. People love those hydrogels. You can put them like in the refrigerator or freezer and they're cold and they're gel and you just put them over and it kind of allows for more moist wound healing, which for really big cracks and stuff can be great to do moist wound, wound healing. Oh, that's good too. Um, there's the silver things. One of the other things I will encourage moms to do if, they, if they've got, especially if it's one side that's really, really bad, is we give that side a break. And if they have a pump, we nurse the baby on the side and we gently pump because we want to keep milk moving so we don't have some of the other issues we're going to talk about. But sometimes just giving that breast like 12 to 24 hours of a break is all from, I need. From like latching. From, from latching. Yeah. Not from expressing milk because we don't want to have engorgement and everything, but from actually having the baby latch on. So depending on what the situation is, sometimes we'll be like, you're just going to nurse baby over here for the next 24 hours. We're going to pump on this side real gently and let that tissue heal. Okay. Um, so- but I mean, coconut oil, like there's a lot of different things that you can use depending on what your preferences are. So, okay. But I'm going to clarify. So you said put milk on and then go topless, which would then be dry. And yes. then you said moist. So depending right. on your body, your preference and how deep the wound is, dry wound healing can be great. And moist wound healing can be great. Okay. Usually for deeper, more dramatic wounds, the moist environment can help it heal a little bit faster. If it's just kind of superficial and it's not too bad and it feels good to have just some milk on it and like, let it air out. What we don't want is for it to get like, um, 
like it needs to be clean. We don't want an infection getting right. into that space. So a lot of times kind of even going back and forth, like, okay, I've had my hydrogels on for a full day. Now I'm going to spend the next day just letting Got like it. my breasts have some air and then like, you know, so kind of bouncing back and forth okay. um, can be really helpful and depending on the wound itself. Okay, perfect. So I feel like that's a huge one is the cracked nipples in the beginning. And that was, that was my thing. And it was the lipstick or chapstick is how my person or my lactation consultant just like, if your nipple looks like lipstick, that's not good. If it comes out like chapstick, we're good to go. And it was <laughs> lipstick. And I was like, every time I had to do the sandwich with my boob and get there on and like, and, but once you go see the lactation consultant, you have the tools to know like, oh, it's not going well. Sometimes she would latch and I would just be like, it's, it's wrong, but it's fine. And Seth was like, no, Shayla, make sure that you're putting her on there. Right. You want this to get better. And I was like, oh, okay. And I so went, let's talk about that for a brief second. It is very common and expected. It should be expected that you will have to detach and relatch and detach and relatch your uh, newborn many times. I did not. And we don't it. talk about this. No yeah. one says that as an expectation to mom's like, oh, no, just pop them on and it's fine. Once you're at like one month, six weeks, yes. yeah. And for the rest of your breastfeeding journey, I mean, now I have a three-year-old who literally knows how to undo my bra and help himself. Like, why well, there's no more helping? Yeah. But at the beginning, there is that like, oh, let's get them off and try again, <sighs> get it off and try again. And that can be exhausting. But I also want to say, just before I forget, when you just said to see a lactation consultant, let me just put into perspective why like a lactation consultant is an important person to see. OB doctors get about, on, in general, three hours of breastfeeding education total in their OB experience. This is not their specialty. Pediatricians might get three hours of breastfeeding experience or knowledge base in their entire schooling. Nurses, even labor and delivery, do not get breastfeeding training except for maybe an hour or two. And a lactation consultant, like in order for me to sit for my board, I had to sit for a board exam. And in order to do that, I did a full year prep course. I needed a thousand hours hands-on helping moms supervised by a lactation consultant. And then I had to sit for an exam that was a nation, a worldwide exam. <laughs> oh my and so gosh. my knowledge base yeah. is like, extensive that it truly is my specialty yeah. so when someone comes to me and they say oh well my doctor told me my mama i'm like you know what i just can't yeah i'm sure if your doctor was a breastfeeding mom or an ibclc let's talk but otherwise they literally didn't get this is not an important thing for them to be trained on it should be but it just isn't it doesn't top, top the priorities and a lot of times the breastfeeding education like at a pediatrician's office will be a formula company that comes in and wants to pitch their formula and they will give breastfeeding education to the entire group and they will talk about how wonderful breastfeeding is and then roll into and if you can't our formula is the closest to breast milk by the and it's a sales pitch right. and so the they're trained in these are the things to look for and if any of these things aren't going well you fix it with formula it yeah yeah and so it's so just um know that not every person who's a mother baby expert is actually a breastfeeding expert. Yeah. And it's really, really great to get a second opinion. Like you would with anything else. If your doctor right. tells you one thing and you're like, I'm not really sure about that. Get a second opinion. And having a lactation consultant be part of that second opinion can be so, so helpful because the knowledge base is just very, very different. Would you, okay. Two parts. Would you say go see a lactation consultant when you're pregnant or afterwards? And second part is for pregnancy mom and mom brain, all of us, how do you find one? Because sometimes if I'm like, people are like, oh, I'm going to see a lactation consultant. I'm like, how the F? What do I, do I just Google lactation consultant in my area? Oh, I do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. So when's so, the right time to see one and how do you find one? Okay. So I would say, um, similar to the support group, if you think you are going to be apprehensive in reaching out and like taking your shirt off in front of a stranger to say, help me with breastfeeding, you should probably meet her beforehand. If you can find one beforehand, if you can attend a group beforehand, even just do an interview and let her know, like, these are my goals. And like, this is what I'm due. And just if, if you're someone who's like, I need to know who you are before I'm sitting in a room with my shirt off. Yeah. And yes, I would meet with someone beforehand. Is that essential? No. 
not at all. Most of the con consults that I do and the people that I see, I have not met beforehand. Um, they just have realized that they need help and they, we get connected. So one of the things, so it, okay, if you deliver in a hospital and if it is a baby friendly hospital, which most of them are moving towards, they are required to give you a list of all of the lactation consultants, breastfeeding support, like the, the support that you have once you're discharged. Now, the problem is that list is usually in a stack of like 40 pieces of paper upon discharge material. No one is looking at it no. at all. <laughs> no. So Technically, there should be a list literally handed to you. The chances of you actually finding it might be minimal. So <laughs> one of the other activities, and I maybe I should just send these to you, Sheila, so you have them to pass along. But one of the activities I used to do in my groups as well is I have this little sheet. And on that sheet, it said, oh, no, I won't pull it up. It said, I'll see if I can remember, um, someone that I know that's currently breastfeeding. And you would fill in, who do I know that's currently breastfeeding? And if you don't know anyone that's currently breastfeeding, okay, but keeping that in mind, someone that I know who has breastfed in the past or is supportive for breastfeeding, that might be a mom, a sister, an auntie, uh, right. um, the closest breastfeeding support group to my, you know, my area. And like, I literally would have moms fill this thing out before they had their baby. Yeah. put it on the refrigerator. And when they were in that moment, one of the things on there was someone I can call it to in the morning for help, because you're right. You can't think through all of these things in early postpartum, but you're going to need to probably call someone in the middle of the night at some point in time. Yeah. You need to know who someone is that's supportive, that has breastfed, that you feel like you can be, you know, candid with and talk to your, you know, about your breastfeeding experience. But on that list, I would have like the closest support groups, the closest lactation consultant. And I would encourage women, even if they didn't actually go to them or call them to literally write out all the phone yeah. numbers yes. and put it on their fridge. The phone numbers. That's such a good idea. Oh yeah. Phone numbers, <laughs> oh like the my God. One was like the day and the time that it meets. And then like phone numbers of the, yeah. my closest clinic. Yeah. I host this, you know, and, and yes, you can just look online. So IBCLC is the like certification that I have. There is a website where you can look for IBCLC certified lactation consultants in your area. So you could just go online and look up IBCLC or the La Leche League, um, breastfeeding support in my area and find things. This, the sad thing is depending on where you are, there might not be much because. Well, that's when they get in your you know, room really group. Yeah. And you, you find someone virtually yeah. and there are always those of us who are willing to help virtually. Right. For sure. Okay. <clears throat> so once we get past the cracked nipples kind of initial, am I, am I in the normal sort of discomfort or am I in the painful, then you can start to get into some engorgement or some mastitis, which my sister had, I don't, it's not a funny thing, but she calls it <laughs> mastitis. That's what she calls it. Because that's <laughs> <laughs> so she was like, remember that one time I had mass titties? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and you were pretty sick. So there's that. So yes. talk about kind of like we talked to, and this kind of goes with our last one with the oversupply, undersupply, but what maybe briefly how it can happen. Cause I feel like it's, I don't yeah. know. I assume it's kind of not, um, I don't want to say obvious, but how it happens, but then what to do. Yeah, so um, engorgement is the first step on your way to something like mastitis. So engorgement is, is going to happen at the beginning of your breastfeeding experience. For the yes. first year, your boobs get so hard. Oh, I, it's like you had a boob job. Thing. Yes, I remember telling you. <laughs> my, I went to my pediatrician and I was like, my sister says I'm going to have, well, I guess it's my podcast, porn star boobs. And, she, <laughs> and my pediatrician was like, um, nice to meet you. You're, you're not, she goes, I don't think so. I think they're lumpy and hard. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> never mind. My sister said porn star boobs. So I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, they get so hard. Yes. So, that's so for the first like four to six weeks, your body and baby are trying to figure each other out. And you're going to go through times where you feel like, I don't think I have any milk. And then times where you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm Dolly Parton. And I like have <laughs> these gigantic food that like, what is going on? Yeah. And if you're someone like me, who's always had like less than an A cup, it's like my favorite. I'm like, oh, look at my boobs. Right. <laughs> they look great right now. <laughs> 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 but 
basically what's happening is your body's trying to figure out milk production, right? And so as your breasts, there are little ducts and these ducts go all the way up into your armpit. They go to the center of your chest. They go up like, so you might have engorgement that even is like bumping in your armpit, like, and down to the side, like it's a full 360 Ooh. of your milk ducts. So it's not like just your breasts. It can go all the way up, which is interesting. Yeah. And so when we, we usually get engorgement when we are not breastfeeding our babies frequently enough. And maybe you've been told your baby should only nurse every three hours. So even though your boobs feel like they're going to explode and they are so full, you're like, it's only been two hours and I just, I can't nurse you until three or whatever. We have all these other reasons, or maybe you're giving a pacifier, you're interrupting some type of communication, you, you can get engorgement. We also can get engorgement if we're just away from our baby, maybe for the first time for a little bit, maybe um, you've gone through a growth spurt where your baby stimulated like crazy and nursed like crazy. And now they've kind of calmed down and you're like, gosh, my boobs feel kind of engorged. Like my body's responding to that stimulation. I have a ton of milk, but my baby doesn't quite need it as frequently. So there are many times and throughout your breastfeeding experience, you can go through times of engorgement, even when your baby's older. Um, just recently, I had a friend whose baby got, like, got sick, just a common cold and nursed like crazy for comfort. And then, you know, the cold was done. And like the mm -hmm. next couple of days, she's like, oh, my boobs are so full. Oh, like wow. my body got used to feeding that baby really frequently because she was sick. And now she's not sick anymore, but my body is still like, here's all the milk. Now it takes a couple of days that milk will come down, engorgement will disappear. So engorgement that like is as minor, I would say, and kind of comes and goes with growth spurts and things like that, illnesses, very normal, very common. Engorgement that happens in the first couple of weeks of the body trying to figure out the baby, normal, common. We just have to keep moving the milk. We just have to keep pumping. And once again, we talked about supply and demand. You could listen to that when we're talking about not creating an oversupply, but like moving milk so that it's not sitting still. Now, what happens is if it sits for too long, milk curdles, like cow's milk, like any other milk, it can curdle. And so if it sits for too long, it can curdle in the milk duct and that can cause basically a clog, a milk clog. And when you then are moving the milk, that clog stops that duct from moving milk and it can get backed up and that can become infected. And that is what we call mastitis. So it is an infection of the milk duct in the breast because the milk hasn't been moved enough. And how do you know one from the other? So a clogged milk duct, I wish I had, I wish I had my teaching supplies here, but a clogged <laughs> milk duct, um, well, the way that I have noticed when I've had them, it, it will be hard. It will be very painful. And I, for me, the milk will back up and I will, I can literally grab a, like, like, a, it feels like there's a, like a, you know, a straw that's full, <laughs> like in my breast and it's painful. And then like all the other breast tissue is soft and seems fine. But then like from this one particular part up, or sometimes it's just, it feels like around, like if there's literally something stuck, like there's a little rock in there and you've got to get it out. So then you massage and you shake and you get in the shower. Um, you can get, if you have an electric, this is gonna sound silly, but if you have an electric toothbrush, you know, that does like vibrates, you can take the butt, not the teeth part, but the butt of it and put it on that spot. And sometimes that like vibration will help break down that clog and you can move it out easier. Wow. <laughs> you have to get it moving. So if you feel something like that happening where it's like, okay, my breasts were really full. I fed my baby. My breast feels soft, but there's this one spot that's still hard and still really full. You've got a clog and you want it moved. Like we got to get it out before it sits there and becomes mastitis. So mastitis doesn't usually happen doesn't happen unless you've got something that's been sitting there for a while. So um, moving that melt, getting the uh, clog out is going to be like number one. And if it does, if it stays for too long, mastitis, you feel like you have the flu, a high fever, you feel achy, sick, uh, you usually need antibiotics, like you're going to feel sick. Women who have mastitis feel like they're literally. And then you have to go to the doctor? All the things. Um, if you've got someone who understands breastfeeding that you can call like a, a you know, what, what you call like a 
teledoctor type situation, or you have a good relationship with your pediatrician, your OB, and you can describe to them on the phone. Usually over the phone, they will like order you a prescription oh, sent okay. to the pharmacy because it's pretty common and it's pretty clear when it's happening. Um, if you don't, then yeah, you have to go in and they assess you and, and just throwing this out there, it is safe for you to breastfeed and on antibiotics, continue to nurse your baby. I I've had a mom who got to the ER with their mastitis and the ER doctor who has no education in breastfeeding will literally tell them you should stop feeding on that breast. It's probably not safe for your baby, which is like the worst thing you could possibly do because we need to move the clog. <laughs> we don't want it sitting there for longer. And then they'll tell you pump and dump while you're on antibiotics. Also a lie. Do not pump and dump while you're on antibiotics. So those moms will leave having their breastfeeding relationship literally thrown upside down. Right. And the best treatment for mastitis and clogged duct is nurse like crazy on that side. Hug so like what crazy. if they, the baby gets the infection or pulls the- They can't, they, can, they won't. So your body, like that's a very localized infection and your body's already creating antibodies to it. So the baby's already getting antibodies huh. the minute your body- is fighting anything. Wild. So babies don't ever get sick from mastitis, but uh -huh. they are the best cure. <laughs> Just to keep them well, and I remember you told me one time, like position them in a different way or something. Yes. So babies tend to draw strongest from their chin. So this sounds crazy, but if you had a clog that was up here, you would want to lay down, flip your baby upside down. So their chin was here and their feet were that direction. And they might actually pull the clog better right. than if they nursed normal and their chin was at the bottom. So yeah, so where your clog is, you can move. So for anybody baby. not watching and listening on the podcast, basically, instead of holding your baby, how you normally would, you're going to lay on your back and basically have them upside down. So their feet are by your head and they're <laughs> head is down, right? Yeah. Like yeah. a 360, like instead of yeah. the top of their head pointing to like 12 o'clock, the top of their head's going to point to six o'clock <laughs> yeah. on your boob. And, and this is the other thing you can do is what we would call like, um, kind of like a dangle feeding for an older baby. This is not necessarily great for like a newborn, but you could also lay your baby down on the ground and like on hands and knees, mm -hmm. like you go over them. So your breast is literally dangling and gravity is helping to pull Wild. down um, so that they, they're nursing, but there's also gravity trying to move that clock. I just, now, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say one of the other things that you can do that I always recommend, especially if women are prone to getting clogs. And I'll tell you like my sister, what, she had mastitis probably three times in the first four months of breastfeeding. Oh. She had this massive oversupply and her body was just prone to like, she wasn't nursing really frequently because she had tons and tons of milk and her body was just prone to getting these clogs and having mastitis. And so one of the things that she did is you can take a supplement called lecithin. There's soy lecithin and there's sunflower lecithin. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at like a health food store. But what lecithin is, is it's basically... Um, it's used in a lot of our food products when we don't want them to get curdled. Like it can be, it's used in like yogurts and things like mm. that. So what it does is it lubricates the ducts in the body and keeps the milk from curdling as easily. So if a woman is prone to this or like with her first baby, she had multiple clogs and mastitis three times. I will tell her like, start taking lecithin the minute you deliver your second baby, because oh. you already know you're prone to this and it's going to help just everything stay lubricated and you less likely to get those clogs. And now, if you get a clog, you can actually take a mega dose of lecithin, like the minute you get a clog and then a maintenance dose. So you can look at the online, there's, you know, what, it's, what a mega dose would be that you could take, like if you're actually having an active clog and then a maintenance dose that might be daily. Like you just take one little capsule daily and it keeps you from having those issues. Wow. That's so good to know that <laughs> I was just, I just did an interview with Abby, who was our exclusive pumper. Yes. And she said that her husband helps her with her clock ducks. She's like, I'm doing better. all the work. He can do something. <laughs> <laughs> wow, girl. <laughs> She's like, it works. I'm like, that's fantastic. So I yeah, mean, well, that's one of the huge benefits that I always felt like when I was tandem nursing was like yeah. when I had my two-year-old and I was nursing my newborn, my two-year-old was my best friend in managing right. my encouragement, my clogged ducts, <laughs> like Help the us most efficient out. in the world was my two-year-old <laughs> and I'm like, come on honey like you know what to do and she yes. was amazing at like right. helping me not have those issues because she was more efficient yeah I didn't knock out 
So the other thing that could happen is a bleb, right? When you're getting the, is it after a clogged duct, you can get a bleb? I think bleb, honestly, is that in and out? Oh my gosh. I recognize it. I'm like, oh, what's that? <laughs> this is like a pregnancy craving at its best. It's two in the afternoon and I was jogging by and I'm like, I need a hamburger fries and a lemonade. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Pulling over. <laughs> yeah. I like did not do fast food unless I was pregnant. And I was like, I think I want Taco Bell. And Seth was like, what? I was like, doesn't a chalupa sound good? He's like, no. Like, oh, exactly. go, go there. <laughs> yeah. You guys should, yeah. yeah. It's for the thing. Right. It is what it is. I'm going to roll with it. Do yeah. I feel guilty? No, I oh, don't. No. Okay. So tell me more about a bleb. Okay. So a bleb is kind of the same thing as a clogged duct, but it's happening at the nipple. Okay. So it's like a clog that has come down and is stuck at the exit. So a lot of times the nipple hurts really bad. The rest of the breast seems to be fine, but the nipple is in pain. Usually it's a little white spot um, and it can hurt like heck. And sometimes when you actually get it out, it's like a string. Like you can actually pull it out. Like what? my blood. Can <laughs> yeah. you like pop it like zit? Is that a dumb question? Like um, I would try and like. So I, I'm not supposed to recommend that you pick at it, but I will tell you personally, that's what I did. I was like, come on. I was like, when I had him, I would try to like pick at it yeah, to get right. it out. Um, but the less aggressive thing to do where you're not like hurting your nipple um, would be to take something like, um, I'm trying to think of what people will use. You can use like coconut oil or like a vinegar on a little cotton ball and like let it soak to try to like disintegrate that spot. Or the haka, right? Do people use the haka? Yeah, uh, haka probably won't. So you need to get it pulled out, but also um, it's, it's basically a piece of curdled, and like sometimes hardened like milk. So sometimes using something that you can like, that will like eat away at it um, mm. and integrate it. Oh, makes I it see. Easier to move it out. Yeah. Okay. So frequently nursing on that side, even though it's painful as heck, trying to get milk moving. Um, our nipples don't have like, uh, I think it's anywhere from like four to, 15 or something it's some crazy range of how many like whole like exits you have for yeah. milk on your breast so some women will only have a handful some women have a lot so um you can that's where it's happening it's like where the milk is exiting it's just this little clogged spot that it just it just hurts and uh, so I would say that the best thing for blebs is like to try to be preventative like nurse frequently all the all the things like okay try not to get any clogged ducts, lecithin can be really great. Okay. Um, and if you feel one coming on or you feel, you feel like you have one, don't ignore it. Like, don't just be like, oh, it'll probably disappear on its own. Like, get it out <laughs> because it won't probably disappear on its own. You need to frequently like be purposeful about nursing on that side, maybe letting it soak in something that could help it disintegrate. Um, and yeah they're painful and they can happen at any time. I think that's the other misconception is like all the hard stuff with breastfeeding is going to happen in the first month. And if you make it past the first month and like you're in the clear, there are so many little things like this. Mastitis can come really at any point in time, blebs. Um, and a lot of times we see those things happen with a transition, like maybe mom going back to work or baby starting to sleep more at night or the introduction of solids where all of a sudden they're not nursing at the same schedule. Right. And so just remembering that like, not to like scare moms, like you're gonna have all these issues, but remembering that like, there are things that come up that still are normal. Like it doesn't mean there's something wrong with your breastfeeding experience. If you all of a sudden get a bleb when your kid's four months old, like it's, there are these things that happen, um, as part of breastfeeding, even if things are going really well. Okay, good. Um, the, another question that a lot of people were asking, and I feel like this is, it's tongue ties and I, and I feel like this is a relatively new cure or I don't know, like a thing. I don't know. I mean, I've never had a baby before. I don't know, but. So tongue ties are something that um, are, I would say there's trends and like people will tell you like way back in the day, every midwife kept her pinky nail really sharp so that if a baby was born with a tongue tie, they could just 
cut it right then and like let the baby nurse better like there's these like myths and things are yeah. i don't know that could be very real and very true right. i don't know if midwives all had a long nail forever ago to cut tongue ties and then you roll into like i would say when we were younger the trend was more like don't mess with your baby like everything's going to be fine and we're starting to see more of a trend now yeah i can't help you right now i'll be with you in a minute in a little bit <laughs> Sorry. Um, and now we have a little bit of a trend moving towards like, let's cut everyone's tongue. And so there is a dynamic of it that's like a like trend and a cultural thing. Um, but there is a reality to tongue tie. And tongue tie can be a huge barrier to appropriate breastfeeding. So for those of you who are listening to this on a podcast, I will try to describe it well. But if you're watching me, this is going to be easier. So what I like to, the way I like to describe it is if you imagine I'm sitting right now and my arms are free and I can put them forward and I can move them up and I can move them down. And if there were the tongue and my body was the mouth of the baby, the tongue needs to be able to do this like undulating motion in order to move milk from the breast. Okay. Now, an anterior tongue tie basically would be like me taking my fingertips attaching them to my knees and then trying to move my tongue like yeah. to my arms so a baby who has an anterior and that those are the ones are really obvious uh -huh. their tongue is stuck to the bottom of their mouth and there's almost like a split in the tongue too right it's like a little line that's yeah. stuck down there so when they cry it makes a heart shape with their tongue and you can look this up online like tongue tie and yeah. you can see like it's, there's a line there that's attached that's kind of like this front being attached and the baby literally can't move their tongue out to hold the breast. So when they are like that, they can't move milk well, they have to hold on with their gums instead of their tongue because their tongue can't move forward. Yeah. So that's the anterior tongue tie. An anterior tongue tie is very easy to spot. It's very easy to um, laser. A lot of times dentists will now laser that and release the tongue tie. They can also just clip it. It heals really quickly. And that's kind of the more obvious one. Now there's a posterior tongue tie, which is basically like my elbows now being attached to the side of my body. So the tongue appears like it can move well, but it actually can't come forward and the back part of the tongue can't move the way it's supposed to. So a posterior tongue tie is much more challenging to detect. Right. It's not nearly as obvious. Most of it, I wouldn't even say that I am good at detecting them, even though I have a lot of experience. Um, it's something that you really go to a specialist. And then the releasing of a posterior tongue tie is um, a little bit more in depth. And we're really trying to release those back tendons so the tongue can move all the way forward. Now, what you have to keep in mind is that baby who was in utero has had a tongue tie since in utero, they practiced the sucking with that tongue tie for months in utero. So mm -hmm. it takes then training once we've released the tongue for it to learn what to do. So um, if you are having, the way I usually like walk through this with my clients is that at the beginning, we're watching how breastfeeding is going. We're looking at weight gain for baby. We're looking at how the milk transfer is going. We're looking at pain for mom. If we get to the two week mark, and mom's still in a lot of pain. Baby doesn't seem to be transferring milk really well. Maybe you're not gaining the way we would expect or having the right wet and dirty diapers. I'm gonna start looking deeper at other things. I'm gonna probably look at their tongue at the very, very beginning because if it's an anterior one, that's an easy noticeable fix. But if the tongue appears fine, then we're gonna like reassess and look at suck and all of this and, and then look at like, maybe this is a posterior tongue tie. So posterior tongue tie is not like the first thing we're gonna jump to for most babies, but if problems seem to persist a little longer than we would expect them to persist, okay. we're gonna look and see like, is there a posterior tongue tie? Do we need to refer you to a dentist that can take care of it? Okay, that's what I was gonna ask next. So who do you, if you're like, what if my baby has a tongue tie? does your pediatrician say something or do you go to a dentist or who tells you if that's the case? So there are, at least in our area, a couple dentists that specialize in babies and children and they specialize in seeing tongue ties, like being able to diagnose them and treat tongue ties. Okay. Um, so you would look for first someone like that. Um, your pediatrician is probably not going to know very much about it. Your lactation consultant probably will, but not be able to treat. Like I don't have a laser here that I could treat a tongue tie with. I'm not trained right. in that, but I could say this baby's got a tongue tie and we need to get it treated. Yeah. So I think step one would be like, get to a lactation consultant and ask for their two cents. Some pediatricians will, especially if they're a female pediatrician who's breastfed themselves, 
they may be proactive about like, let me look at your baby's tongue. Let me see, you know, but for the most part, it's not their specialty. It's more of the like dental side or even OT or um, like a, what am I trying to say? Like a physical therapy where they do like um, the therapy ear- e- treatments. ET, ear, throat, and eye doc- doctor. ENT. So like those types of specialists, especially right. if you're a pedi- pediatrician one, may have, um, you know, the ability to diagnose and help. But usually we go to, in our area, there's a couple of dentists. That's, that's what we did. We went to a doctor because our, our pediatrician said she's got a lip tie, a tongue tie, and a cheek tie. And we were like, what? what? So we, <laughs> we went to the dentist and we were super apprehensive. We were like, I because she was gay, she was such a chubby baby. We're like, how? And I'm like, it's kind of uncomfortable, but we're moving through this. So ours was amazing. She, it was like a free consultation and she looked at the baby. She watched her latch and she's like, are you uncomfortable? And I'm like, not terribly. She's like, baby's gaining weight. She does have a tongue tie. And she goes, is she choking when she's feeding? And I was like, yeah. She goes, so you probably have an oversupply. So probably what's happening is your oversupply is compensating for her tongue tie. <laughs> Give her some time. And when she gets, as she gets older, she'll get strong enough that it, it'll be fine. So she, she was great. She was literally like, if you're not super keen on it, I don't think you need to do it. If you just want to do it because you think you need to do it, let's do it. And we were like, all right, we're going to go, but we'll come back if we need something. And it was, we were fine. Yeah. And that is, that's kind of the way I like to, it's like, let's look at the whole picture. If we've got a mom who's not hurting and the baby who's gaining weight, if it's not broken. Don't fix it. Like, mm-hmm. and tongue ties can stretch. There are some, um, depending on, on the severity of the tongue tie, there can be complications with speech later. Mm-hmm. That's speech what they told less. us. Right. Right. But also let's cross that bridge when we get there. Like you, yeah. you know, and so for me, I have, well, all three of my kids had a upper lip tie. So like a pretty tight upper lip. I was sore at the beginning with my daughter had definitely had like some minor cracks and stuff, but it wasn't, we were getting better. My soreness was disappearing. She was gaining weight. Like it wasn't actually interrupting our breastfeeding experience. Yeah. I didn't want to intervene if I felt like it was unnecessary. Right. And our, do- our dentist no, our pediatrician, we had a real holistic pediatrician that then moved and made me so sad. But anyways, he was very much in the same boat of like, proceed with caution. Like, I don't, I'm not going to go mess with your baby if we don't need to. And he basically said, look, this situation may cause a gap in her adult teeth when they come in. And like, if that's an issue, they'll cut it then. And you can have her adult teeth come in without a gap. Right. And so we waited and sure enough, she's fine. Her baby teeth fell out. Her adult teeth came in. She's got braces. She doesn't have a gap. It hasn't been a problem. Right. Like yeah. we didn't need to do it. And we were just cautious and waited because it wasn't something that had to be done right. Right. Then. But if your baby's not gaining weight and you're in incredible pain, yeah. of course, that's like, yeah. and they say, yeah, yeah. they've got to like, great. This is the solution. You do it. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome. So the next thing, I feel like we're going along the journey of, I'm slowly trying to like get out of the light (laughs) as I keep moving over here in this video, but okay. So we went from you, what do we do? We did crack nipples, engorged mastitis, blebs, tongue ties. So now we've kind of like gone through all those and a few months in your baby gets so distracted when they are nursing. And this was (laughs) a ton of questions. They're like, well, my baby used to just like be half asleep all the time. And now they're just wide eyed and they don't even want to latch. What am I supposed to do now? Yes. Okay. So distracted babies are a real thing and it happens for a couple of reasons. The main one is their eyesight gets better. When babies are born, they can only see about 12 to 18 inches from their eyes. So think about how amazing this is. And like, I just think it's the most incredible thing. When a baby is latched, the only thing they can see in focus is their mom's face. That is so cool. (laughs) Everything else in the world is blurry, (laughs) but they can see their mom. And instinctively, we know this, right? Like if you pick up a baby, you instinctively put them somewhere between 12 and 18 inches from your face. Like we, our our biology knows that this is where a baby can see me. But as they get older, three months, four months, five months, their eyesight gets better and better. And all of a sudden they can see that fan or they can see that bundle. Oh, someone just walked in. (laughs) And their brain is absorbing that information. So it is very expected and common and wonderful. Like if, if 
I have a mom whose baby isn't doing that, I'm literally concerned because the brain growth tells us that a baby should be like, I'm nursing, what's that? Oh, I'm nursing, oh, what's that? The other thing that we know is that babies who have a good breastfeeding attachment with their mommy feel very, very, very safe and secure at the breast. It's like their happy place. So it is also a place where they instinctively want to experiment and are going to, to practice new skills when they feel they're safest. So you've got the baby who's nursing and they've got one foot that's like climbing yeah. up here and then yes. they're like got their hands in your mouth and they're just like all and you're like, why can't you just nurse? But, uh, but what they're saying is I feel so safe right now. I can literally explore all the things. I can try my new skills. I can practice grabbing and releasing and like there's nowhere I feel safer than right here at the breast so this is where I want to practice all right so then do you need to be concerned about them not getting enough food no so that's the other thing to know is that when your baby's at that stage we can really take a back seat to following their lead which we can do kind of from the beginning but especially at that phase a baby is going to get what they need from you once they're like two and a half three four or five months old so if they're hungry they're gonna eat <laughs> and if they just need a snack like i always remind moms you don't eat exactly the same amount at exactly the same time every single day you have a drink of water, you might grab a granola bar, you might sit down for a huge meal and then grab a little snack. Your baby will do that with breastfeeding. The very first milk that a baby takes is mostly hydration. So if your kid comes, they nurse for three to five minutes and then they leave, they were just thirsty. They needed some hydration. They didn't want Thanksgiving dinner, they were thirsty. (laughs) And so allowing our babies to do that. And, um, you know, if they are nursed for one minute and pop off and get distracted and they come back and they nurse, like not a problem. They're going to get what they need. Now you have to decide as the mama, how much tolerance do you have for that? Because some women are like, I hate that. I hate the popping on and the popping off and it drives me nuts. And I don't want to do this breastfeeding thing if my baby's popping on and off all the time. So that's fine. And that's a boundary understanding that your child is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with your breastfeeding relationship because they're doing that. But if you need to create a boundary around that behavior, because you don't like it, then you create that boundary and you lash them. And when they pop off, you put your boob away and you tell them we're all done for now. You popped off and mommy doesn't want you back and forth. And your baby with time will learn, oh, if I'm serious, I better come and eat yeah. and stay here. And then when I'm done, you know, it's gone and it gets put away. So that, that's more of a parenting thing of creating boundaries around what feels good for you. But uh, the distracted baby is for sure something that every baby goes through. And it's a really, really good sign that your baby's brain is growing well and that they feel safe and secure so i think where the a lot there's a lot of information on instagram and (laughs) one of the most popular things is feed your baby okay so your baby's gonna need a full tank in 24 hours right well if your baby doesn't get all the milk they need in the daytime guess when they're gonna fill their tank at nighttime so you need to fill your baby during the day because if you don't you're gonna be up all night and so I think that's where the anxiety comes from of like you need to eat now why are you looking around please eat because I don't want to be up all night and so like first talk on that but I like went in a dark room with her I would go in there to like try and help can you hear her screaming (laughs) this is real I hear my yelling too (laughs) you're like be right there (laughs) yeah um so yes I do and I think um there's a there's a there's a lot going on in that um statement and the understanding of like I need to fill my baby, but you know, for them to sleep, whatever. So I think the first thing to know is that, or the first thing to decide as I'm, as a parent is what you want your relationship around food and your baby to be. Now their food is a really interesting thing. (laughs) And we end up with a lot of power struggles around food. We end up with a lot of eating disorders as children get older around food. And a lot of those patterns are literally set by the initial way we feed our babies. So for example, if you are a formula feeding mommy maybe, or you're feeding with a bottle and every single time your baby cries, you just put a bottle in their mouth. It stops them from crying, the baby can't cry and drink at the same time. And you just make the assumption that they're upset and they get a bottle. 
you can set a pattern for your child that says, when you're upset, stuff your face you eat. Yeah. and you're going to eat. Like every time you're upset, we're not going to process that feeling. We're just going to feed ourselves. And so there are, there's like this interesting component to as a breastfeeding mom, I have chosen for myself to decide that my children know what their body needs more than I do. So I might think my child needs to eat right now because I think it's been too long or I think they're going to wake up hungry. But that is my assumption about my child's body that may or may not be correct. And so deciding where you fall on the spectrum of, I want my kids scheduled. I want to know exactly what they eat. And like, that's going to make me feel good. And I'm not saying this is good or bad or better or worse or whatever. There's just a spectrum um, to the spectrum of, I'm going to totally let my kid decide what they eat, when they eat and how they eat. And that transitions into like solids and, you know, from then on. Right. Um, and so just deciding like where you as a family sit in that, what your conversations around food are going to be. Um, I know a lot of our parents' generations were the generations where they sat and they couldn't get up from the table till they finished the food on their plates. Yeah. And like, it, is that your family? That's what you're going to do. That's what you expect. Okay. Is your, is your family, the family who says like you eat until you're full and you're done. And like at our house, you eat until you're full and you're done, but it doesn't mean you get to have a snack in five minutes. Right. Like after dinner, like that's it. So the kitchen's closed. You can wait till tomorrow, you know? And so I think it, some of those things, although we don't really think about it, are patterns that we, we choose to set early on with breastfeeding. So sometimes a distracted baby or a baby that bites, which is what we we're going to talk about next yeah. is because a mama is like, come on, you need to eat. Right. And a baby's like, I don't want to, yeah. <laughs> and I am going to bite you. Cause I know that the, you'll stop nursing me if I do that, oh or I'm going to just keep popping off and let the milk spray me in the face. Cause I'm yeah. not interested right now. And so I think, um, deciding, what your priority is and how, what your emotion around that's going to be. Cause children sense that too. The more you push, the more likely a kid is to not. Oh my want gosh. To that's like when I need something to do. And I'm like, you need to go to sleep right now. Those are the longest times to get her to sleep. She's like, you want me to do what? I'm like, go to sleep. <laughs> and baby sense are, they're very, very, very sensitive to our emotional state. And I, and even adults, like if you were to sit on an airplane, and you were sitting next to someone who was scared to fly, like panicked to fly. By the end of that flight, you're going to feel some of that. You're going to oh, feel like, yeah. let's just get off. I'm yeah. ready to get off this flight. Even if you've yeah. never been scared to fly in your life. Yeah. And so take that ability of us to feel others' energy and multiply it by about a hundred with your baby and you. If you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling uncomfortable, if you are, maybe you're sitting in public for the first time out at a park and you're really nervous to feed, but your baby wants to feed and you can tell that they're hungry, they're gonna be a nervous eater and probably popping off and looking at you and around like, what are we doing, mom? Why are you so nervous? Yeah. <laughs> And so I do think there's a component to our, uh, like take a self check first. If your baby's having to freak out about something, are you freaking out? Because maybe you need to go to the dark room and sit quietly and take a deep breath and drink some water and calm yeah. yourself down so that your baby can go, okay, mom, I'm ready to be close to you. I'm ready to nurse. I'm ready to chill. Cause it's hard to be around someone who doesn't feel right. comfortable and yeah. feel, you know, relaxed. And so um, mm -hmm. breastfeeding itself makes our brain do that. Like breastfeeding releases the oxytocin and serotonin that make us relax and take a deep breath. But prior to feeding or, or if you are stressed, if you're feeling like, come on, you have to eat right now because we're going to be leaving for the store and I can't feed you at the store. I just wish you would eat. Your baby senses that and is most likely not going to eat well. Right. <laughs> so you have to decide at that point in time, I'm either going to just go to the store and figure out nursing while we're there or sit in the car if I need to nurse or whatever, or I'm going to just take a deep breath and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to give myself 30 minutes to try to let, you know, relax so that my baby knows I'm not stressed and we can eat and then go to the store a little bit later, or, you know, you right. have to kind of figure out what you're going to do. But I do think that's a lot of the frantic distracted baby is a representation often of mirroring the mom's energy if she's not doing hmm. well. Um, but then there's just the happy distracted because they can see things. <laughs> yeah, right. What's that? <laughs> this is a whole new world. <laughs> so do you think that the, like fill the tank during the day thing is a thing? So it's hard to say. We do know that a normal baby. So 
if you look at babies all around the world and like the biological norm for a child is to eat at night like parenting you don't get to like not parent at night it's a 24 7 job feeding a baby especially the first year of life we know that babies that frequently breastfeed at night are at lower risk for SIDS they just do better they're mammals they're supposed to eat a lot and at night so it is a very typical pattern to see a baby do what we call a reverse cycle when they start to have huge developmental growth spurts. They start to crawl for the first time. They start to roll over for the first time, walking, um, developmental milestones with language, with sight. Anytime these types of things happen, babies can reverse cycle, meaning they get in the daytime so busy working on this new skill or the brain yeah. is so busy developing that they do nurse more at night to kind of make up for it. Because at night is when they're resting, they're growing, right. and they're about to roll into tomorrow of like lots bigger than my brain yeah. is going back. <laughs> yeah. So that pattern is normal and expected. But once again, culturally, we don't expect it. We don't protect our sleep the way that we should as adults. We put our kids to bed early and we stay up for an extra four hours getting all the things done. And then when they're up every two hours, we're like, are we getting no sleep? But we're like, we missed out on four hours of sleep we could have had. Yeah. Or, um, you know, we have these cultural expectations Going back that our babies shouldn't feed us at yeah. night, that they should sleep really well, that they should sleep in another room. And that's all like a whole nother topic that we could talk about. But when you realize that your baby's behavior is actually not incorrect, it's your expectation that is probably incorrect, then you have the choice to try to manipulate your baby's behavior to fit your expectation or change your expectation to fit your baby's behavior. Right. And for every family, that's really going to totally. look different. Some people yeah. will tell you like, I sleep trained and my baby doesn't eat at night at all. And like that works for us. And that's yeah. what we do. And she eats during the day and like, Whatever she eats during the day, she eats during the day and it's fine. Yeah. And some people will tell you like, I go sleep, I bed share, like my baby nurses whenever they want, which sometimes means she's so busy during the day, we make up for it at night and I don't yeah. care. Right. You know, so I think it really has to, it depends on your, your family, family, what's working yeah. for you. But the behavior of that is not incorrect or anything to be concerned by. It is just a, every single developmental change will result in a difference in how they feed and how they sleep. So yes. even just knowing that, like knowing to look for it, like yeah. how they seem like they're nursing every hour at night and then didn't nurse instead of being like, this is the worst. being like, oh, my baby's going to do something big. They're going to have a developmental leap. Like, I can't wait to see what they do next. Yeah. So like just changing the mindset. Once again, totally. where groups come into play, like yeah. once again, support groups, period women sit around a circle who are all like, oh, my baby's not sleeping well. Like, well, how old is your one? Three months. And your one, three months. And yours three months. Yeah. Guess what? Your babies are all going through the same right. developmental growth spurt. And like, you know, and then by the next week, they're like, my baby's rolling over for the first time or whatever, you know, yeah. it's like this predictable pattern that we yeah. see. Um, she hasn't texted me yet. Yeah. I'm watching. Sorry. We have to pick up my daughter from a birthday party, but I haven't gotten to pick her up yet. No text. problem. Let's Anyways. do, you said we were going to do biting next. So let's talk about that. So biting, once again, is something that is developmentally appropriate, not necessarily on mom, but appropriate, right? Their teeth are coming in. Babies can teeth for months before teeth actually come through. It can be really uncomfortable. And once again, here with mommy is one of the places they feel the safest. So a lot of times here with mommy is where they want to like work on all the things that are happening. Yeah. So... When it comes to biting, um, I would say one, know that your child is not doing it maliciously. Like it is not an on purpose malicious thing. It is a developmental thing and their teeth probably hurt. Um, I will tell you what I did for my children when they were teething and they bit me like hard for the first time. Um, it's okay. So it's very easy to be like, <laughs> what was that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And have a reaction that almost seems funny or like laugh or like startled and if a baby because usually you're, we're talking like six seven eight months nine months old when this is happening yeah. if they get a reaction from you that feels like a positive reaction to them, a laugh a smile uh, there's a temptation to recreate that behavior 
right? To get that response. <laughs> and so our babies are very smart. They want a positive response from us. And so when I had, I was, I tried to be very purposeful about knowing what I was going to do when my baby bit because I knew it was going to happen and I needed, I wanted to be prepared with my, my response was going to be. So this is just me personally. This is what I chose to do is when my daughter bit me for the first time, I looked at her with pain. Ouch. And I popped her off. That hurt mommy. That hurt mommy so bad. You may not nurse if you're going to do that. And I put my breast away and I set her down and I literally walked away from her. I put her somewhere safe on the floor and I walked away and I said, you can't, that's ouchy. And I tried to create the very clear connection that if you bite me, we are done. I right. can't, you are not, that is not okay. Right. This is my body. This hurts me. And only did that maybe two or three times before she realized this is not a behavior I can do on my mom. Yeah. And so, and now not to ignore the behavior because the behavior of biting is not bad. We want our children to get their teeth in. We want our children to be able to chew food. Like yeah. biting is very appropriate, but biting mommy is not appropriate. So I would also then come back to her and say, and, and sometimes sign language, you know, you know, that hurt mommy, like ouchies, that hurts. And you cannot bite mommy, but you can bite this. And immediately having an alternative. So, uh, and, and so, like I, we make teething necklaces in my breastfeeding support group that like, as mommies continue to breastfeed, they get a bead for every month that they breastfeed. So by the time your baby's like six, seven months old, they've got like a decent little necklace. Going. Yeah. And so I encourage them like, put your necklace on. And if your baby bites you, ouch, oh no, that hurt mommy. You may not nurse, put your breast away. You can bite on this, but you cannot bite on mommy. And yeah. showing your child like where that behavior is appropriate. You can bite on this washcloth. You can bite on this toy. You can bite on, I'm not saying don't ever bite. No, right. we want the kid to bite, but they can't bite you. <laughs> right. So creating, and, and this is true of every developmental thing, like climbing, for example. If you try to spend all of your time and energy and effort telling your kid not to climb, that's kind of detrimental. We want them to have that skill. We want your child to you know, have the skill of climbing and moving their body. Yeah. Can they climb on top of the oven? No, that's not right. a safe place. So like redirecting, you may not climb here, but you can climb on this. Right. You may not climb here, but you can climb. Throwing, we want kids to be able to throw things. Should they throw books? No. Yeah. Can they throw a softball? Yes. You yeah. know, so same thing like, oh, I see that you want to throw, yes. you may not throw this, but you may throw this yeah. you know, and showing them where the behavior is appropriate. So I feel like biting is the same thing. It's an appropriate behavior, just not on mom or on another child or, you know, on someone that could get hurt. So helping clear a very, very clear association for them, stopping the breastfeeding session when it happens, and then offering them a space for biting is appropriate. At least is what I yeah, that's feel like. Such good advice. I love that. The, the exclusive pumping mom that I had talked to. It was her third baby that she exclusively pumps with, but her first bit her, she reacted so strongly, 21 day nursing strike. And I'm like, 21 days, you didn't quit after 21 days. She's like, no, I wasn't done yet. She said, my pediatrician was like, well, looks like you guys are done. But then she went to a lactation consultant who told her to walk around her house topless with the two favorite foods yogurt and guacamole or like avocado on her nipples as bait. And she's like, she took the bait and we kept <laughs> and I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Like that's crazy advice. But she's like, yeah, it worked. It worked. Well, uh, and that's the thing too, is like when I've had moms who say like, okay, my baby bit and I reacted really strongly. Now they won't nurse. Depending on the age of the baby, my advice might be very different, but if they're an older baby, I would be like, they'll get hungry enough. Like it, stop offering walk around topless, but stop offering, stop put, you know, because if you, if they bite you and two minutes later, like, okay, come back and nurse that is just like, they, they'll get hungry enough. They'll get thirsty enough. They'll want that attachment enough Yeah, right. that they'll be like, okay, I'm back. <laughs> mm, yeah. But, okay, but if you're offering all these other things, cause you're worried, like my baby's probably starving. So I've, I've just increased the table food. I'm feeding them by 10%. Well, yeah, they're not going to nurse. They're not hungry. Like, they're right. not, <laughs> yeah. you know, like you gotta, anyway, yeah. But yeah, it depends on the age and it depends on the pattern that's been set. Like if a mom's been like, oh, my baby's been biting me for three months straight. Like that's going to be a different journey to try to get that baby to stop that behavior. <laughs> then realizing like, this is going to happen. How am I going to react? And right that initially. I love it. Okay. Last question. And this one you brought up, I was like, what else is something that's like 
common things that you find. And you're like, I find once you've hit that milestone and you're like, okay, I hit six months, I hit a year, I hit two years or whatever it is. Society or your dad or your like partner, my dad, I say it to my dad. My dad's like, you still get a nursery when she's in high school? And I'm like, maybe. I was thinking college, but high Bring school it might be a good stopping point. Like, so like that pressure from your partner or anyone else around you and kind of how to navigate that if you're not, if you're not done or you decide, okay, maybe I am, maybe we are going to keep going. Yeah. I think that is, um, it is so, so common for, especially first time breastfeeding mommies to have a pretty small goal. Like their goal might be three months. Like I'm going to do this for three months or I'm going to do this for six months, or maybe their goal is a year. I'm going to breastfeed my baby for a year because in all honesty, they probably thought it was weird to breastfeed your baby for longer than a year, but then you get to that point. And if you've connected yourself in, let's say a breastfeeding group and community, and you're watching moms who are breastfeeding two-year-olds and three-year-olds, and you're there and you have this one-year-old and you realize like they're still a baby and like this is still something I love and this is the way I get them to sleep every night like why would I give up I'm still giving them immunity and we're in the middle of a pandemic like this is this is still really beneficial and I love it and they love it and I know I said it was only going to go to a year but I'm thinking that I want to do more you're literally Uh, describing me (laughs) (laughs) yes and that's a lot of women who successfully make it to a year it's like why would I stop now like this is literally fixes everything she falls down she's crying pop the boob in her mouth like it's just the best and so when we hit that place usually it's the external people that start to question maybe it's society like you said maybe it's a spouse and so I think there's a few things that you can do in that situation um one is just providing information depending on who it is if it's someone who's like going to respond to the data and the facts like being able to show them information that says a child's immune system is not fully functioning until between the age of three and a half and four so since we're in a pandemic and they rely on my immune system right now i think i'm going to keep nursing for a little bit longer and if you've got a super scientific husband who wants data he might go that's a really good idea you should keep nursing because this kid's immune system is not ready for the world yet okay that's great you know like finding what's going to kind of um help yeah, the, exactly. that person be on board. And if you don't know what that information is, it's very easy to find. Like you can look up benefits of nursing a toddler or benefits of nursing past the age of one. You can talk to a lactation consultant. You can talk to you know your friends who are nursing those older babies. And um, the other thing that, especially when it's a spouse. So for me, I was the one who's putting our kids to sleep at night, breastfeeding them down, nursing them throughout the evening, night when they woke up. My husband will selfishly tell you there was no way he was going to ask me to stop because that meant he was going to have to get up (laughs) and he was going to have to parent at night. And it it was actually a heck of a lot cheaper. It was a heck of a lot more convenient for him. He got exponentially more sleep the longer that I breastfed. And so he's like, why would I discourage you from doing this? Like my life would get harder (laughs) right now. Everybody's would in, in a lot of situations, like the yes. whole weaning process, the stress. I, yeah. oh. Yes. So I think having that conversation and then a lot of times when it comes to the spouse, there, there's something else going on. So maybe it's, well, my husband really just wants us to like get back to like a more normal sex life. And he feels like having the baby nursing all the time. And it's just kind of hard. And so then we usually jump in. This is a lot of the support group conversations we have too, is jumping into, well, let's talk about that. Because if you're not having sex and you're not having an intimate relationship, it's not your baby's fault. <laughs> like teenagers figure out how to have sex when they shouldn't be. <laughs> like yeah. you can figure out how to have sex yeah. with, your husband, with your baby in your bed or, you know, having a breastfeeding relationship. It's like, that's a different thing. Let's not put this off on the baby. Like it's the baby's fault that there's something going on in your relationship. Let's look at that. Right. And realize that there's a lot of benefit in keeping this breastfeeding relationship going. Let's work through what's actually happening between you and your husband. Um, and, and maybe, maybe there is something that we need to negotiate. Maybe there is something that needs to change with the breastfeeding relationship, but let's not just assume that like all the bad things are because of the baby's breastfeeding. Right. And it's very easy to make that jump sometimes for people. Yeah. Um, or for, for grandparents, like oh, your baby's so hard to watch because all they want is to breastfeed. Yeah. Or they could just be one and hard to watch. Like right. yeah. there are also formula fed babies who are not 
happy when their mom's not around, you know, right. like, so let's not put it all off on breastfeeding. Let's talk about the actual issue and see if it's connected. So I think that's a lot of it too, is assumptions about there not being any benefits. Mm -hmm. And so then dispelling that, those myths that there's tons of benefit. I like to tell people, because I nurse my kids till they turn four and they're tall children. So people thought I was kind of crazy, <laughs> but I loved the shock value of reminding people that anthropologically speaking, what we believe is that human babies, because we are mammals that feed our young with our milk, were intended to breastfeed as long as they still had milk teeth, which is what we call like, like a kitten has its little milk teeth and then those milk teeth fall out and that's when they're supposed to wean. So human babies should nurse till they're like six or seven years old. Oh my gosh. And there's benefit until their milk teeth, their small baby teeth fall out. What? So you tell someone that, <laughs> And then you're like, but I'm just going to nurse till two. And they're like, well, that's not as bad as seven. Yeah, right. you, do you. <laughs> you nurse till that's two. So funny. Well, and I feel, four. yeah. And I, I never had like an end date of like, I'm going to nurse until X. I was just like, I literally, I don't know. I don't think that far ahead. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. We're going to see how it goes and just see what happens. I, and maybe it's because I am feeding past one, but I feel like COVID babies are being breastfed longer than other babies because we've been at home with them. We found that breastfeeding works. We are, have been with them all the time. They nurse to sleep. They do all these things. And we're like, yeah, I'm not getting, I can't stop that at one. Like, <laughs> right. I can't Why believe I thought I like what? And so I, I don't know if it's a thing or if it's just because I'm experiencing it, but it just feels like more people are like, yeah, we're not stopping at one. Yeah. And well, I don't know when like we'll stop either. Like here, it's like this, this last year, I feel like in a lot of ways just felt like it was lost. Like it just like, yeah. Not very much happened, but also it felt like it kind of flew by. And I do think there's a lot of moms who are like, I can't believe I already have a one-year-old. Yeah. Where did this time go? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep nursing. And like, we just started this, I think. Yes. Right. <laughs> it's all a blur. Oh, yeah. All right. But I, and I do think there's, um, there is really good information. Like the internet can be great and awful all at the same time, yes. but if you can find good information and good support, it's very like this why you should be breastfeeding yes. <laughs> like this yeah well and that's actually a topic that a lot of people want to hear from you is extended breastfeeding and tandem and all that so oh, well, definitely to be continued, to to yeah. be continued. Yeah. yes we will absolutely do that topic I would love to talk on it amazing um, well it's it's interesting just simple things that you wouldn't think about but once you do you're like oh, okay that's great so right. well and just and just to know like maybe you learn all the things and you're like nope I'm still stopping at one Cool. Great. Yeah. No, I think just like knowledge in general is fantastic. It is. So. It's so powerful because the, the saddest thing to me is when I have a mom who maybe finds our group, let's say that's her second or third baby. And she sits there and it's like, had I known that with my first, I wouldn't have stopped. Wait, had I known that with my first, I wasn't ready to stop. Wait, wait. And it's like, that is heartbreaking to me that like totally. mom didn't get the experience they wanted because of a lack of information. Now, yeah. if you have all the information, you make the decision you want, exactly. you do you. Yeah. But if you are not getting the good information and especially if your mama heart wants one thing and you stop for some other reason, it can be really heartbreaking because this for a lot of us, this, this is it. Like you're going to get to breastfeed a couple children and, and that's it. Like we don't get this time again. You don't get this experience right. again. And we haven't even talked about this can be another topic we'll put on our list. We haven't talked about the benefits to mom. Yeah. There are actual physiological benefits to a woman's body when she breastfeeds and the longer she breastfeeds, the more she reaps those benefits. So that's another thing that like, if your you know, husband's like, Oh, you're nursing past one. Well, let's pull up some of the data on the like decreased risk of all the different cancers and osteoporosis and postpartum depression and like all the things that we know are different for a woman who breastfeeds her baby. And that can be really motivating for continuing to support too. Yeah. So we'll talk about that again. Gosh, you're just like, just the depth of your knowledge is, <laughs> I love it. And I love how excited you are always about talking about it. So thank you again for getting on with me and just chatting all these things. I think this is going to be so helpful for people to know just all the things. I'm just really grateful that you're doing this. So thank you so much. Of course. I'm so, so glad we had an opportunity. <laughs> me too. And we'll do more. We'll do more, more to come. Sounds good. <laughs>